everyone, and welcome to this episode of In Lay Terms. I'm your host, Payman Ascari, and back with us again is Mr. Leighton Gray. How's it going? I'm well, thanks for asking. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gray, I wish we could have uh, brought you here under better circumstances, but it's always some perilous bill. So, so yes. without further ado, tell us, tell us uh, the, the Leighton Gray perspective on Bill 63. Well, I'm going to start maybe with the uh, 40,000 foot view. Um, and I've been saying this for a long time. I, I wrote a piece for my show comparing uh, Justin Trudeau to evil King John of a, about 800 years ago, who, who actually, you know, his behavior spawned the Magna Carta, which is the foundation of the rule of law in the free world. And the, 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 essence, of, uh, the essence of the problem is that um, what we're becoming in Canada is not a, a country that is ruled by law, uh, but but it's a rule of laws, and um, you know the you know Justin Trudeau actually said something the other day. He flew into Alberta, kind of had a clandestine meeting with our premier. He 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 he, he sort of issued a veiled threat to Doug Moe and Premier Smith that uh, they could be arrested if they don't follow the new Justin Transition Energy laws. But he said this. He said, "You can't opt out of the federation. You can't opt out of Canada, which is actually wrong. Uh, we are a country of laws." We're a country of rules and responsibilities, and it's evolved over 150 plus years to this extraordinarily successful country. Well, it was until about 2015. We expect people to obey the law, <laughs> including our prime minister. That's what governments expect of their citizens. That's what his expectation of us. We're all supposed to follow his laws. Uh, that's what citizens should expect of their governments. And that, that with that last point, I, I agree. But what we're seeing right now with Bill C-63 and also with Bill uh, C-367, which is actually a liberal bill, uh, which is being sponsored through the auspices of the Bloc Quebecois. 367 is the one that would remove from Section 319 of the Criminal Code the religious exemption for where, where you quote scripture uh, in criticizing something like gay marriage or transgender ideology, things like that. It, that bill would remove that exemption. So that even if you quoted what it says in, in, in Corinthians or Galatians or Romans or, or even the Old Testament about traditional marriage, for example, um, you, you would be liable to criminal prosecution. Well, this latest bill, this latest iteration of what seems to be a descent into full totalitarianism, of which uh, George Orwell would, be, uh, even, would even make him blush, is this Bill C-63. Uh, and uh, here what we have is to protect children from sexual exploitation, um, it seems the government thinks that this Online Harms Act, um, you know, is, is necessary. It, it's clearly unnecessary, and I'll explain why, but uh, this is what the Justice Minister, uh, Arif Farani, says. He says, I am the parent of two young boys. I will do whatever I can to ensure their digital world is as safe as the neighborhood we live in. Um, arguably, the digital world is the world they live in. But anyway, children are vulnerable online. They need to be protected from online sexual exploitation, hate, and cyberbullying. Well, the reality is we already have laws that, that, that protect them from that. Um, but this bill, in my view, is totally unnecessary to protect children. The real goal is to allow judges. Uh, these are the same judges who recently on International Women's Day which happens to coincide with the celebration of the Bolshevik Revolution on the 8th of March, 1917. Anyway, um, uh, you know, it happens to coincide with the Supreme Court of Canada's statement that we need more diversity, uh, which means women in our courts, even though we have more women than men on, on that court. Anyway, it's for the judges to sentence adults to prison for life, for things they've said and for up to a year for crimes they've committed, uh, they haven't committed, but that the government fears they might commit in the future. So this bill actually is the most shocking of all the totalitarian, illiberal, and anti-enlightenment pieces of law, of law that have been introduced in the Western world, I think, for many decades. And uh, just to get a sense of how dangerous this is, I did a little bit of research. And, of course, Great Britain uh, is ahead of the curve uh, on us in, in this. They've, they've, had, they've had legislation like this on the books for several years. And in 2018 alone, they had nearly 3,500 people charged, 
prosecuted and convicted of uh, online harms, of hate speech. And I'll just, I'll just give a couple of examples uh, of, of how scary this is. One example, and, and some of your viewers and listeners might have seen this one. Uh, there was a woman, she posted something on Facebook that was unflattering about a, a police officer, I believe it was in London, uh, because uh, b- because she said she was a lesbian or something of the kind. Well, uh, within within hours, that same police officer, uh, who was uh, dissed, as it were, online, shows up at this person's uh, home, and this poor lady is dragged out of her kitchen and arrested. And uh, the, to to the you know to the smirking of this police officer, and ultimately that woman was convicted of a hate crime. Uh, a scarier one actually occurred uh, also in Great Britain, where a young woman, a young white woman, had a friend who happened to be a black man who had committed suicide. Well, she posted a very uh, loving tribute to him online, in which, as part of the tribute, she uh, she reproduced the lyrics verbatim of uh, the deceased favorite rap song well of course like most rap songs the word the n word is is used repeatedly well e- even though she she didn't intend this to be at all hate speech in fact she intended this to be the opposite of hate speech uh she was charged prosecuted and convicted and she will have a criminal record for life for hate speech so um this is a very very frightening development indeed for Canada. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very shocked and, and disturbed that there isn't more of a backlash to this. Um, it, it, people in Canada are saying things like, well, Canada is broken. There's a lot of shoulder shrugging. Um, we really uh, need, as, as a nation, uh, uh, to, to stand up and say no. Listen, f- forget it. You're not passing this law. We're, you know, we're we're not enforcing this. You're not. You're. We're not having this. Uh, stop it. We don't want this. Uh, but unfortunately, in in Canada, we're just seeing uh, from all points. It seems in terms of the administrative establishment that's running the country, um, this descent into full totalitarianism. And uh, one other point that's that isn't directly connected, but is obliquely. You know, we had a decision out of the Supreme Court of Canada from a woman named Sheila Martin, who, who's a very, very bright, very talented legal mind. She, she was formerly the chief judge of our Court of Appeal in Alberta. She's one of our two representatives on the Supreme Court of Canada from Alberta, who are both women now. Um, she actually said in a sexual assault case um, that it was um, unfortunate and confusing that the trial judge had referred to the victim of the sexual assault in that case as a woman and 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 uh, 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 overtly said that the appropriate way to describe the victim in that case was a person with a vagina well uh, that that the reason why that's connected that's connected here is because the supreme court of canada uh sets the the tone for many of the laws many of the things that we recognize now as law in canada for example you know recognition of transgender rights gay marriage things like uh, uh, policy on abortion um uh, rights of, of immigrants and all these things come from the supreme court of canada not from parliament so now we have the supreme court of canada basically issuing direction to every judge in canada and really every person in Canada, that the appropriate way to refer to someone we've recognized from time immemorial as a woman is a person with a vagina. And that means that if we call a person uh, a woman instead of a person with a, with a vagina, under this new law, it is that there is a potential that someone could file a complaint, which incidentally would be anonymous, um, and that uh, you could be subjected to hate speech prosecution just for referring to someone as a woman, and if they take offense with that for any reason, or if anyone takes offense with that, uh, you could be prosecuted under these hate speech laws. So it's a it's an increasingly dangerous moment in Canada, really for all of us. And too many people fail to realize this. Uh, those of us like you and myself who are content producers, uh, who are operating in say in say a journalistic way, uh, this is incredibly frightening because um, you, know, you and I have 
posted it produced, uh, you know, re- literally hundreds. And some of us uh, in the community have produced thousands of things that could all found the basis for hate speech prosecution. So it's an incredibly bad law. It's a totally unnecessary law because we have hate speech legislation on the books in the criminal code and elsewhere, uh, including the Bill of Rights codes that fully protect people from this type of harm. And so it's very clear to me that this is not aimed at protection of children, as as our justice minister says. I think where we're going with this, and this is my kind of my last point I'll finish off with before I throw it back to you. I think what's going on with the Liberal Party of Canada is they've been looking south and they've been seeing uh, what the Biden administration has been doing to Mr. Trump and some of their political enemies. And those of you who've been following what's going on in the U.S., you'll know that Mr. Trump is being attacked on all sides. He's had a civil judgment worth about half a billion dollars and one of the most ridiculous, unfounded defamation cases I've ever seen. Um, And he's being criminally prosecuted elsewhere. Those prosecutions are falling apart. But at the same time, the use of this lawfare is uh, somewhat unique in, in, in our history in North America, where we're use, actually using the power of the state, the exclusive power of the state, uh, this, this oppressive force. The state has an, exclu- has an exclusive um, monopoly on, on the use of force, and they're using it to punish and actually try to destroy their political enemies in a situation where the ruling party, and this is true of both Canada and the United States, the ruling party and the leader is incredibly unpopular, in fact, historically unpopular. And what they're trying to do is instead of playing the game by the rules, they're trying to use it to to work the rules of the game, change the rules of the game and take out their political opponents so that they'll, they'll win by acclamation. And I don't think it's an accident that this law in Canada, these laws are being brought in now at right on the heels of some of the comments that Mr. Polivier has made. Um, concerning Alberta's, uh, you know, protection of children bill, where he came out and he was uh, he was criticized for some of the things he said in support of uh, the use of, uh, of, you know, the banning of the use of puberty blockers, and uh, and you know, child uh, surgeries, transgender surgeries. Uh, so so if this law comes to pass, it's foreseeable and I think probable that the Liberal Party of Canada, which is at historical lows, if we had an election today, we would have, I believe, the greatest majority ever in Parliament. Um, the Liberals would be lit- would be completely destroyed, uh, much as con- as the, the Mulroney Conservatives were uh, back in 1992. And I think that the Liberal Party of Canada has calculated this, and I think they're going to use these laws first on their political opponents, and then uh, they're going to work their way into our, our society. But fundamentally, these laws will change the fabric of Canadian society if they come into effect. We will be a society of, of uh, informers, uh, informing on our neighbors. If you don't like somebody, you know, if you have a competitor in business, if you're, you know, if you're competing with the top plumber in your town and you don't like them, you can comb through their social media, find something they said that, that you don't like or, or that maybe is offensive. You can report that anonymously. They'll be prosecuted. It will destroy them, might imprison them. And uh, that's just one example uh, of how these the, these laws can be weaponized. So they're extremely dangerous. And we should be we should be shouting from the roof, rooftops. Just no, no, no. This we we cannot have this. Uh, nobody in Canada uh, uh, should want to live in a society where laws like this can exist and persist. But that's my that's my my take on Bill C sixty three and also Bill uh, C three six seven, which was in, introduced last November. Um, but it, but it's still there in, in, and could be and I think will be passed in conjunction with C sixty three. As uh, as changes to our criminal code. Yeah, I'm I'm starting to sense. You know, the situation is dire um, when when there's not even a, a single latent gray dad joke. So yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> things, are, things are escalating. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, yeah. sorry, I'm I'm uh, I'm slipping. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm very concerned. I mean, uh, some of us are are actually thinking about well, you know, should we find residences outside of Canada? I mean, and this is happening all over. I'm sure you know people who have left Canada just out of fear that they could be arrested, uh, which is a really horrifying thought. I couldn't have imagined this five or even 10 years ago. So so I, I want to get there, but I, I want to hold the audience's hand and guide them through. Yeah. So let, let's draw a line from Bill C-11, the Online Streaming Act, to then yeah. B, Bill C-18, the Online News Act, and now Bill C-67, the Online Harms Act. 
I, I see a massive escalation in in the use of, uh, I don't know, violent language. Like the language in these yeah. bills is very aggressive in 67 yeah. compared to 11. Yeah. Uh, do you agree? Why or why not? I totally agree. And what we are seeing, I mean, we're dealing with people who are progressives. And uh, their game that they're playing is supposed to be politics. Um, but that's that's not the game that they're playing. The, the, the game that they're playing is power. And, uh, you know, the Liberal Party of Canada has become very, very uh, good at this game and also very addicted to it. And um, they simply uh, are operating in a way in which they do not see themselves bound by the laws of Canada. And that statement I, I read off the top from Justin Trudeau um, just shows the level of delusion under which he is operating. Uh, you know, it reminds me of that famous Solzhenitsyn quote where, quote where he says, you know, we know they're lying, they know that we know we're lying, and on and on. And and that's really what we're what we're seeing is... Um, uh, they they're, they've changed the meanings of all the words, and um, they're re, they're constantly redefining them uh, and ratcheting down. And there is a progression, and the progression is is natural. Um, it's natural from their point of view. The broader picture, and my friend uh, David Lees, who has a wonderful uh, podcast on on the on the Frontier Center for Public Policy, um, had a guest on recently. He was talking about this. The bigger picture is what we're seeing, in, in my estimation, is an importation of uh, the politics of the CCP. Uh, so we are going down the, the same road that they went down, not, to this, not in the same way that it happened under Mao, but I, what, we're, what we're descending into is a level of totalitarianism, where the, individ, the individual just becomes smaller and smaller, and, and the state becomes even bigger and bigger. And to get a sense of this, uh, we actually have a situation where the Prime Minister of Canada uh, flew to Calgary, talked to the Premier of Alberta, and during a press conference would not shy away from the suggestion by a reporter that, uh, the, that the Premier of the province of Saskatchewan would be arrested for not enforcing a federal law. And uh, just to put context on this, um, Canada is a federation. We do not have a national government. Uh, we have we have a federal government and a provincial government. Each uh, the the provincial government and the federal government are sovereign within their specific areas of responsibility and jurisdiction. That's what our constitution says. That's the supreme law of this country. Uh, but uh, the supreme law of this country is becoming the will of the prime minister. That's what we're seeing. And that's why this language is becoming more and more aggressive. And the behavior of this prime minister in public is becoming uh, more and more frightening. Um, he's sounding more and more like a Fidel Castro and, le and, you know, and less and less like, like a prime minister of Canada. Um, he's abusive. He's intolerant. Um, he, uh, he uses language um, that uh, is more hateful than any political leader that, that, that I have witnessed in my lifetime in Canada. And the threat, even the, 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 va even the veiled threat, that a premier of, of a province in Canada would be arrested because he is the leader of a party that has passed laws, duly, duly passed laws in their province, um, which are opposed to federal legislation, to me, is, is, is disgusting. That's a sign that we are living in a country where the rule of law is becoming uh, less and less real. And, and where, as this federal government tries to expand its power more and more, um, you know, it, it's becoming increasingly frightening to live in this country, which has been a, a beacon of light and freedom to the entire world. Uh, and don't take my word for that. I mean, just look at how many people are still trying to come to Canada because they believe that, that Canada represents all those things. All the people, the many millions of people who are waiting in line to come to Canada, um, they don't understand that, you know, they have a picture of, of the Canada that we used to be. Uh, and, you know, you see now in the news, many of the people who have come here expecting that vision of Canada to be at least partially real are finding out when they get here that, that uh, that's not what Canada is anymore. And uh, that should be a very clear sign to those of us who have lived here for a long time and have been very blessed to live here, 
that uh, we need to do more to restore our Canada to its to its great heritage and its great future. And I think that's the, that's the real challenge as we as we see uh, these bills becoming more and more, frankly, hateful, uh, more and more, uh, you know, restrictive of our liberties. Um, you know, you see this government becoming increasingly unpopular. That's a good sign. Uh, but, you know, we need to do more than just, uh, you know, answer polls. There's an old saying uh, that for, for adults, uh, you know, voting is like writing a letter to Santa Claus. Well, we have to stop. We have to stop wishing in this country and we have to start standing up and saying, you know, for example, when the prime minister says something like that in a, in a press scrum, we, we've got to shut. We can start shouting at him and just say no. Um, but, you know, uh, another very scary thing about what's going on right now is is in Quebec right now we have a farmer's revolt. We have people out on tractors. Well, if you can find a news story about that, please send it to me because I can't, you know, and this is a very important political protest going on in our country. It's being completely suppressed. So these are all examples of what's going on in our country with the with the expansion of this totalitarianism. Having said that, I will say this. I don't think that they're going to win. I still think there are too many good people uh, like you in our country who believe in the principles of freedom for which this country has stood uh, for a very long time, really hundreds of years. And uh, I don't think that the liberals are up to the task of taking over Canada uh, and turning it into, uh, you know, a, you know, a Chinese satellite state. I just, uh, I, I refuse to believe that that is conceivable. I think they're trying very hard, but ultimately, uh, my bet is is on freedom. So uh, thank you for the in-depth explanation. Um, to move it along again, I'm going to give my impression of the bill. So okay. this bill, it's a censorship bill. I think if this was in the U.S., you could say it's the Intel community that brought it. My personal opinion, CSIS, it got after it, the kerfuffle with the Chinese thing, I think they got totally brought it under the thumb of the federal government. That's just my opinion. So I, I don't see it as an Intel bill. Yeah. But I, I do see three different elements. On one end, you have what you call the judicial activism end. So these um, overreaching, you know, life imprisonment to tools that they built in there. Right. In the middle, you have the Marxists. They're like, hey, look at us. We want to put something in there, too. They're like, all right, whatever. We'll put genocide in and you can molest the definition of that word. And um, on, the, on the other end, the front end, which is what I'm, um, what I'm, what I'm very concerned with, is the regulations. And I think that the, the yes. unions and the socialists brought this. Um, so, so I see it as regulations, Marxism. Uh, executive uh, judicial activism. Uh, how much of that do you agree with? How much do you disagree with? I, I think that's a very astute way to break down this bill. And, and I also agree with you that um, as frightening as the punishment parts of the bill are, I totally agree with you that the main goal here is censorship. Because as you know, it really is impossible practically uh, to censor every single, let's just take even podcasters, right? There's too many of us now to censor us all. However, um, if we if we can be frightened into being silenced, into being afraid to, to say something that, for example, could be interpreted by a court as advocating genocide, and we begin to censor ourselves, that's where they win. It's the it's the intimidation. Again, it's this monopoly of force. This is what we're seeing from this government, which is so frightening. Uh, they're even threatening premiers with it with with censorship. They're they're threatening premiers with arrest. Well, if they're threatening the premiers of provinces, I mean, what the heck protects the rest of us, little people? Um, so yeah, I totally agree. This is uh, there's a progression here that runs right through the bills that you described. And um, we're probably not done. We're probably not done. I'm sure that they've got uh, more in their little tickle trunk of horrors, uh, even beyond the scope of C63 and 367. Um, I, and I think what we're going to see, where this is going to go, is it's going to, um, it's going to result in um, really overt and clear um, discrimination uh, against and persecution of specific groups of people whom they do not like. Um, and among them are going to be uh, that, you know, Jews and Christians uh, and, you know, people who have property, uh, in particular, quote unquote, white people, if such a race exists, um, you know, Asian people who have, 
who are have you know demographically are the most successful people in our society. Um, so you know, I I think this is uh, we're just we're just on the road uh, to a very very dark very very dark place that I think um, is is going to be much like somebody lying in their bed at night and having their door kicked in and having them dragged off to to a gulag. Um, people say, well, or maybe might be listening to this and think, well, that's that's ridiculous. Well, you know, read some of the journals of people who lived through uh, what happened in Europe in the 1930s, how, where Germany went, you know, from 1933 uh, to, to about 19 uh, to to the early 1940s during the World War II, and you'll you'll see this is a progression. Uh, the the Nazis didn't start out hauling everybody, all the Jews, and putting them onto trains and hauling them off to Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz and places like that. Uh, that's not where it began, okay? That's where it got to. But in the beginning were, were laws like this, you know, where you ha- if you were a Jew, you had to, you had to register. Uh, if you were a Jew, you, know, you had to uh, wear an armband. And then, of course, uh, you were restricted from certain public places. Um, you know, that this this is this is the arm of totalitarianism, and it's just it starts to squeeze harder and harder and harder. But I do agree with you. Censorship is a huge part of it, because um, without political dissent, you cannot have a country that's free. Um, well, one thing I'll also add. So, it is a censorship bill. That that's true. But I look at it as government is like a black hole. So when it reaches a critical mass, <laughs> all of our freedoms, our tax dollars, our property, everything falls into it. So yeah. I look at Ezra Levant, for example. He came out and he, he's focusing on this life sentence, $75,000 anonymous. I get that. That's one part of it. Yeah. But the part that no one's looking at is the regulations. Like I read this thing um, and I, I thought like, oh, my God, I have a tech company. Mm-hmm. Like these regulations would bankrupt me. Yep. They're, 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 I think what they're saying is, all right, we, we want censorship. We want 100% control. We want totalitarianism. One way we can do that is through the courts. Another way we can do that is through industry. We'll quietly regulate everyone. And I don't think people are paying enough attention to the regulation aspect. Mm-hmm. Do you agree? Disagree? I do totally agree? agree. I totally agree. And, and you know, this is how, uh, this is how totalitarianism is done. In you know in Nazi Germany they didn't have courts they didn't need courts uh, they went for several years without without access to courts and then they they reconvened when there was a, a serious uh, uh, assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler probably, people have probably seen these they reconvened a court of sort of a kangaroo court and they broke out uh, Chief Judge Roland Freisler who ultimately was um, was sentenced at Nuremberg, and he screams at these people, you know, who are involved in the in the plot on Hitler. But for many years in Nazi Germany, there were no courts; they didn't need them. And the reason why was precisely what you just said: that all of this can be done through this bureaucracy, which has exploded in, in Canada under the Liberals, and this administrative state, what uh, <laughs> Mr. Trump calls the blob uh, or the swamp. Um, they control the levers of everything. And, and uh, this is the way totalitarianism is done. It's the way it was done in the Soviet Union. It's the way it was done in Nazi Germany. It's the way it's been done everywhere. And that is through these regulations. Uh, these regulations have the force of law, but they don't have to make their way through, um, you know, courts or even parliaments. And a lot of this stuff, a lot of these powers, unless people, someone takes a deep dive, as you did, uh, they don't realize the extent to which uh, this power is being wielded and how it impacts, uh, you know, their daily lives of, until, of course, it's too late. And to your horror, you're like this woman in, in London who's getting dragged out of her kitchen because she had the temerity to say something insulting about a police officer, a local police officer. Um, you know, um, if we have to live in a society where it's criminal to offend somebody, uh, we simply are not free. Um, you know, that it's it, it's that it's that it's that plain, it's that obvious. But you're right. Um, the 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 mechanism by which this is being done is a tried and true formula, and it's not part of Canadiana. It's not part of our history. It's being imported here. Uh, it, it's a script, a totalitarian script that we thought we were exempt from. You know, we were complacent. 
We thought this would never happen here, and here it is. It's happening right now, and we're sort of in the suspended disbelief um, that, that that our government that that our government is actually our enemy, and uh, we have to sort of snap out of that and realize that uh, you know we need to stand up and we have to we have to get rid of this government. We have to get ourselves out from under the boot of the of this government before it's too late, Bef- because they're removing all the tools by which. Um, we can we can exercise dissent and we can remove them. And I think where this is going, um, and I think they already have this in the works, is um, uh, they're, they're going to prevent there from ever being a free and fair election in this country. Uh, our last two elections are highly suspect because we know that the Chinese have been interfering in them. Uh, even CSIS has confirmed this. Um, and so there's a serious question of whether or not our, whether or not our last two uh, federal elections were were free and fair, and and uh, I think we're going to get to a point where the liberals, in order to hold on to power, will uh, will change the election laws. This is something that has happened in places like Russia, um, and could very well happen here. Um, and I think that's that could that it seems to be following the script. That's where we're going. The asymmetry of of our uh, conflict, where they don't believe in the crime, but they believe in the cause and they will do anything. So they know that using, you know, this kangaroo court system is wrong, but they want equality, equity for transgenderism. They want universal health care and uh, and public education, no no child left behind, no crime, so disarmament, no racism, so anti-racism. They they know, they want these things so badly, they will do anything. What's your message how do we get around that? What's your message to people on the right that, that are trying to fight back? Well, I, first of all, I would question that that is what they want. Um, and I'll use uh, the, the parable of the, of the tarantula, if you're familiar with this. This is from Nietzsche. And the parable of the, of the, of the tarantula, he, he created this metaphor. And the tarantula is the, is the liberal state, uh, which for our purposes would be large L liberal state. And it weaves this web, and what it comes, it comes in the name of equality. It comes in the name of freedom. It comes in the name of democracy. It comes in the name of these rights that you're talking about, trying to make everybody equal. But actually, the tarantula is only interested in growing itself, in its own power, and in expanding its own web. And so what it does is it draws it draws people you know the this, the you know the quote unquote unwashed the disadvantaged uh, you know the victimized into this web simply to devour them and uh, this is precisely what is happening in Canada. Let's look at the indigenous peoples. Have indigenous peoples flourished under the Trudeau government? Absolutely not. There have been many many promises uh, of, of money. Of uh, cl- of clean water, uh, you know, they, now uh, the, the 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 federal you know legislation, for example, on child welfare has disrupted very very functional uh, you know child welfare systems in Alberta and and other provinces, which is a, a an overreach. Um, you can see what's happening with the federal daycare that was supposed to be an equality. It's a complete disaster. Uh, they've destroyed the ability of private day- daycare providers to provide affordable services. And this uh, quote-unquote $10 a day uh, daycare has turned out to be a, a complete disaster. Uh, so let's look at, uh, you know, let's look at, for example, uh, you know, people of color. Are, are, is their situation improving? Are, are, do they have more rights? Uh, are they freer in Canada? Well, clearly not. So uh, let's take women. Well, prior, you know, if if you look at if you go back to 2015, you would find that in Canada, you know, women were never as as free, never as prosperous, never as educated uh, as as they as they were at any time in history, in any anywhere in history. And uh, has the lot of women improved under this government? Um, where now we have the Supreme Court of Canada is actually challenging and redefining what a woman is. So if you are a woman now, you're no longer a woman, you're a person with a vagina. So the truth of, of, of this is they, they come in the name of these things, but actually their only goal, their only purpose is to graft power and money to themselves and to increase their control and to enslave and, and actually to a large degree kill the people that they're pretending to, they are pretending to help. Um, 
The best example of this has to be in terms of diversity, inclusion, equity, which is a complete disaster. People starting to are starting to wake up from this, but there's no idea that they have that hurts people uh, more. The people that are that it supposedly helps. There's no there's no idea that they've come up with that actually hurts them more. If you don't believe me, read any Thomas Sowell book. Uh, so so I would disagree that their goal is to achieve these things. I, I do agree that they're coming in the name of those things. But in fact, they're, th- those, are just, uh, those are just the quote unquote useful idiots, um, the excuse for taking, for taking the power. Uh, you know, they want, they want power and so they, you have to trade, we have to trade our rights and our freedoms for them. But I do agree that, um, that, this, uh, that their, their lust for power is insatiable and it won't stop until we stop it. Um, that's that's the message. Um, this is still a country in Canada where um, we have the ability to remove governments peacefully, and we need to do that. And we, there need to be wider calls for the resignation of the prime minister and the, and the taking down of this government. That's my that's my view. I agree with that, and I, I'm just going to re- uh, recapture it and reframe it. And, and fix up something, what I, how I asked the question. So, yes, business is the, the tarantula example you gave. I, I, I think of it as a, uh, sorry, government. I think it's government as a business, and cr- the, the criminal court is the market that they're in, and they've saturated the market, so they're looking for new markets, so they're just creating crime everywhere, you know, like yeah. hate crime now. Yeah. So I, I agree with that. The useful idiots part, I'm in politics, so I can't call them voters idiots, but let's yeah. call them the, the masses, the mass. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have the, the ones on the left, uh, take illegal immigration in the U.S. They know illegal immigration is wrong. Deep down, they know that. But if they come in and they go into the blue states and they increase the census for the blue states, then they can bring out utopia, um, universal health care, disarmament so there's no crime equity so there's no you know lynching of black people or whatever is in their mind so Mm -hmm. so they're willing to tolerate the crime as long as it it promotes their cause Mm -hmm. and i think what the people on the right what they need to understand and this is what i'm trying to tell them is uh, this is who we're up against let's just assume that they're evil and let's figure out a way to reverse this and 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 like what you said like they need pushback i i think um i don't know how you phrased it but there has to be um, deterrence. Yes. So yep. if there's no deterrence, these guys will just, they'll keep doing what they're yeah. doing, just like yeah. a criminal escalate. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. And we do need, we do need a battle plan. Uh, the, the, uh, the enemies that we're up against really are, uh, one is, uh, is complacency. Aristotle said this. He said, uh, the, you know, the, in the death throes of any state, you will find an overabundance of two qualities. One is complacency. We're seeing that sadly in Canada. And the other one is tolerance. We're hyper tolerant. We're too tolerant in this country. Um, I'm not saying we should be intolerant, but we should reject ideas that are patently evil. And the bills that you and I have been talking about today are patently evil. They're anti-freedom. They're anti-human flourishing. They're, they are violent. They, these These bills actually target people for violence the violent uh, ex- expression and execution of the of the power of the state against the individual and um, from top to bottom these bills violate just about every right that is set out under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms you go all the way through section 2 with, with freedom of religion freedom of expression uh, you you go on to mo, you know mobility rights, which we saw violated during COVID. Section seven, right to life, liberty, and security of the person. Section eight, protection from a reasonable search and seizure. Section nine, protection from arbitrary detention. There's elements in, in these bills which uh, which violate the 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 right to counsel under section ten a and b of the charter, and then section eleven. Uh, which are the procedural protections, you know, being tried within a reasonable time, being able to face your accuser, uh, you know, all, all you know, the, the presumption of innocence. Uh, and then Section 15, freedom from from uh, from arbitrary discrimination. So w- when the government starts passing laws that are fundamentally uh, unconstitutional, that go against the supreme law of the land, uh, we all need to be very, very alarmed because what they're really doing 
is they are rewriting the laws of Canada. They are rewriting it through through the auspices of the administrative state. They are rewriting the Constitution of Canada without following the processes that are there uh, to protect the Constitution. Uh, we have a process for constitutional amendment. It's very rigorous. Uh, and um, and what this government is doing is they're simply rewriting the laws uh, because they have the confidence that, that the judges are in their hip pocket and will permit them to do this. Uh, but the solution, the solution, is is uh, is you know is really the the public will, the express will of the populace. Um, we still have time. We still have the tools to do it, and we must do it because if we don't, the stakes are extremely high. It, it's Canada and the West right now is in an existential crisis. We cannot overstate that. So for the audience, uh, when, when uh, Mr. Gray says it's, it's an existential crisis, you can connect a couple of dots together. So back in like 2016, 17, we had the GDPR and nobody paid attention. And then now you have the censorship law coming out in Europe. You have this law that's in Canada. You, uh, Mr. Gray alluded to laws that have been on the books in England. And then recently, I have no idea what the hell AOC is smoking, but she's saying that any tech company that questions the elections, they should be forced to sell that company. So uh, to me, I, I, I understand it, it's nationalization. So yeah. I, I see socialism through regulation, over-regulation of tech industry to what she said. I think the goal is nationalization or quasi-nationalization. Mm -hmm. And the um, I, I call it uh, information auditors, uh, information accountants. The, the person in your company that you have to put in to answer the questions of the government, that's like an, that's another cost, the same way as an accountant is a cost. And I think it's time we put our foot down. This is, they're, they're regulating industry to death. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, reg they're regulating us to death. And uh, people should be concerned about MAID because what MAID is, it's the legalization of state murder. Um, right now, it, we're, it's, being, it's being presented to us uh, as uh, as you know, some sort of uh, you know it, euphemistically um, as a euthanasia product, but but actually with the expansion of MAID, which we're seeing uh, in Canada, what they the way they want to expand it, uh, Mr. Macron in France, they've just adopted legislation in France that is looks very much like uh, MAID legislation in Canada. Some states in the U.S. are looking at this. Uh, we should be very concerned about this because. Um, how hard would it be for uh, a state which controls the medical college to diagnose people uh, with uh, certain illnesses that are set for uh, extinction under MAID, and then uh, people just start to disappear? If this sounds crazy, if people think that I, I'm sounding nutty, uh, I just refer you back to history because this is exactly what happens. Uh, people in, in totalitarian societies, political dissidents, uh, you know, historically have been institutionalized. Uh, take Alexander Solzhenitsyn, for example. Um, uh, take uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example. And uh, and uh, under the auspices of the state, uh, they're they're simply arrested and removed, and they're exterminated for their political views, uh, for their religious views, uh, for their views about uh, gay marriage or transgenderism or genocide. So um, that's another area where we see the encroaching state. Um, there, we, we, we should not have a situation where the state has the power to legalize um, murder. Um, and that, that is what suicide is. That, that, is, that is what that is. Uh, when, I mean, the state uh, should not have a monopoly on determination of whether or not a person's life can be ended legally. Um, that, that to, to me, that is a, a very dangerous thing that really uh, we should be more concerned about than we are right now in Canada. And it's no coincidence, folks, that um, Canada is a world leader not only in MAID, but also in organ harvesting. There's more organ harvesting going on in Canada than in anywhere else in the world. That's disturbing. I didn't know that. Um... Okay, we're number well, one. Uh, we're, number one. We used to be just hockey <laughs> and maple syrup. Now we're number one. <laughs> number number one in organ, har organ harvesting and state and state sanctioned death. I, if anybody's wondering, this is my nervous laughter. This is the, this is my coping mechanism. Me, me and Lee, yeah, me too. Yeah. It's not funny. It's not funny at all. It's disturbing. You know, it. Uh, 
folks, uh, I hope anyone watching and listening to this, you know, just uh, gets filled with righteous anger um, for what these people are doing to our country, what we're doing to you, we're doing to all of us. Each one of us is impacted by these laws. No one is exempt from this stuff. All right, Leighton, let's end on a, on a positive note. What are the chances that we could use this law to throw our politicians in jail for the hateful rhetoric? <laughs> well, um, that's the problem is, of course, they, they control. This is what I say about the, the monopoly on violence. They control the state. They control, they control the use of the, of the state power of arrest and prosecution and, and imprisonment uh, and indeed death. Um, so that's, that's the scary part is that in a real sense, what they're doing is they're setting up a scenario in which, um, you know, our, our leaders are exempt from the very laws that they break. And I, as again, I hearkening back to that quotation from our prime minister, you know, he talks about obeying the laws. Well, this is a prime minister who's uh, set the, the all time record for violating parliamentary procedure. Uh, he breaks laws all the time. Um, and where his government is, uh, is suspected of breaking laws, um, they collaborate with the NDP to shut down investigations. Um, you know, we still don't have a resolution of the SNC-Lavalin situation. That's going back several years. That's pre-COVID. So um, uh, I think uh, I don't think that we can hope to prosecute these people, um, at least not while they're in power. I think uh, I think I, I would encourage uh, Mr. Polivier if he's listening. Um, or some who, beco- who becomes his justice minister, or, or maybe if it's Mr. Bernier becomes our next prime minister, um, to do that in the aftermath. I think we do need to have a full-blown uh, investigation of what happened. And I think what we're seeing, what's being revealed to us, is really just the part of the iceberg that's, that's poking its head above the water. Uh, it really is horrifying to think what is, you know, what is lying beneath surface of what what has been happening with this government i i think everybody can see and really they don't hide anymore how corrupt they are how oppressive they are how violent they are how hateful they are of the canadian people only only a a a government that actually hates its people would pass laws like this these there's nothing that about these laws that uh is remotely uh, advancing of human flourishing and human freedom and prosperity. Uh, and that's, that's really, that's the most worrisome thing about seeing a, a government that is bringing forth laws like this under the, the, the false auspices of, of you know, parliamentary procedure is that uh, really what they're doing is they're acting against their own people. They're acting against their, the constitution, which is the foundation of our nation. Um, and so, uh, yes, I do hold out hope that at some point, uh, some of them will be held to account. But in the meanwhile, um, as Canadians, we, we have to, we have to really, um, wake up and get out on the, on the streets the way our, our European brethren are to say no to all this stuff. Because, um, if we don't, I think we, we risk really getting steamrolled in this country. Uh, we're very, very close to the end of the line here and, uh, you know, it's time to wake up. I am encouraged by the polls which show the massive unpopularity of the Liberals. Um, but but what's worrisome about that, too, is that, uh, you know, the Prime Minister comes out and he says something like, well, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a, in a popularity contest. Well, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. The only reason why you've been able to be Prime Minister, uh, being such an incredibly unaccomplished person, uh, is because you won three popularity contests. So when the Prime Minister of Canada, who's a politician, says he's not he's he's not in a popularity contest, we should all be worried because he's basically saying is uh, I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't care if you like me because I don't have to please you. And to hear that from a politician, it may be the scariest thing he's ever said. Well, that was a somewhat hopeful message. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe. Maybe uh, we'll, we'll get a, a new government and they'll they'll turn vindictive well, and they'll go after the old one. I did say something uh, hopeful earlier, and that is I I don't believe that they're going to win. In fact, I know they're not, because in the, you know evil never wins. It never does, and it won't win here. Uh, but uh, you know, in the meanwhile, we've got to be vigilant, and uh, you know, we have to we have to think rightly. We have to be brave. We have to work together. And uh, we have to um, we have to really join hands in opposition to what this government is doing. 
and that that's where the hope lies is if if we can stop turning on each other which is what they want us to do and turn towards each other um and, and unite in terms of our our shared values um uh, under our under the banner which is our flag then i think canada has a very very bright future indeed in fact i think canada's best days are ahead of it um i, th- I think that our the promise of our country is so great I believe that this got this country is God anointed. It has a very important purpose to accomplish in the world, and it's all in front of us. And you know, sometimes uh, you know, revealing my 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 religious views here, um, you know, God prepares us for great work that needs to be done. The stories of this all the way through the Bible, uh, and uh, it may be that Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government is you know the the hottest fire uh, in which strongest steel is forged and that this may be a period that our country needs to go through so that we will we will experience greatness in the future think of the americans and what the civil war did for them uh you know th- th- this could be canada's moment where where we're going to be tested and if we survive and if we get through it we're going to be a much stronger nation we're going to be a more grateful nation we're we're going to be better in every way for having lived through such an horrific experience uh as as justin trudeau and the liberals so if that's hopeful then then great uh but but my my message is uh, is that i think canada's uh, best days are ahead of it and that's why i'm still here and i'm saying the things i'm saying and i'm and i'm encouraging other people to do likewise and uh, to stand up for what they for what they believe in because i think most canadians uh really understand the importance of freedom and uh prosperity and human flourishing and uh, you know they they want to have uh safe streets and they want to have strong families and great schools and beautiful universities uh they want to share the beauty of canada with the rest of the world we want to be free to travel uh that's that's canada that's our nation that's what it's been for a very for a very very long time and I think those shared values, uh, you know, are are very, very universal. And uh, we can bring new Canadians here who will embrace them. And uh, and that will make our country better. But uh, in the meantime, you know, we're uh, we're on the sick bed a little bit. We got to fight off this virus. And the virus is the Liberal Party of Canada. I like that uh, the virus analogy. <laughs> um, well, uh, Mr. Gray, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Best of luck with everything you're doing. And, you know, God bless you for doing it. Thank you. 